So are these done? Are these ready to go? Huh? So it's actually the piece. No, there's just I don't think so. Because then it looks like every sentence starts over and over again. You kind of take the yearbook for granted. It really takes a lot of work to put this together. And I've put in, you know, lots of man hours. <laughs> it makes me, like, really happy just to see everybody looking at what we've created and what we've spent so much time working on, and it's just a great accomplishment. I want it to be that, like, so that on every page of the yearbook, whoever's looking at it can feel some kind of connection to the people on that page. When people look back on this, they'll have a, like a little time capsule of high school for the rest of their lives. The yearbooks created by all of the schools throughout Austin over its history would fill libraries. And like those yearbooks, the history of the school district is a rich tapestry of strong leaders, class clowns, and memorable events that have brought our city schools to where they are today. From its creation in 1881, the Austin Independent School District has led a vital and ongoing campaign to provide Austin's youth with superior educational instruction. AISD has contributed immeasurably to Austin's richness and uniqueness by continually encouraging the city's young people to adapt, achieve, and aspire. Drawing on the incredible strength of its students, faculty, and administrators, AISD faces its challenges head on, focusing squarely on the future, even as it remembers its past. At the dawn of its public school system, Austin was fast becoming a modern city. The first railroad had reached town in 1871, and a small gas company began a decade later. Telephone service, electric lights, and horse-drawn streetcar lines soon followed. Electric street railways began in 1890, and in 1894, Austin erected 29 2,000 candle power lights, reaching 150 feet in the air, and providing the city with permanent moonlight. Nevertheless, Austin retained many features of an old west town. Austin in the 1870s and 80s was a small town, but it was a pretty wild town. It was a pretty lively town. Looking down um, Pecan Street or East 6th Street in Austin, uh, you'd see livestock moving up and down the street, horses hauling wagons. There was a lot of partying. People would come into Austin to party because they, they lived in rural areas, so they liked to come into town and have a good time. Gunfighter Ben Thompson was elected Marshal of Austin for 1880 and 1881, and he frequently fired bullets through the ceiling of his saloon at 10th and Congress to frighten the typesetters from the Austin Democratic statesman who worked on the second floor. But even as Austin was making the slow transformation from a frontier town to a modern city, its system of education was largely a relic of the past. Austin had built its first publicly funded school in 1876, but the majority of Austinites remained indifferent toward public education and the city's numerous private schools continued to dominate the educational landscape as they had for nearly 50 years. One of the drawbacks was a conservative or stubborn attitude about what should be done with public money. This was a town that wasn't building a lot of infrastructure. There's an anti-tax bias. Um, people don't want to pay for whatever it is that, that the government is asking us to pay for. And there was even a, a bias against paying for public schools here in Austin. Essentially, there were, there were dozens of private one-teacher schools and you paid tuition to send your kid to school. And there was a lot of opposition from the citizens who A, didn't want to pay the taxes to support the school system, or B, operated the private schools and were making their living from the private schools. Despite the opposition, many civic leaders felt the time was right for a system of public schools to come to Austin. Among the voices leading the fight was A.P. Wooldridge. Well, Alexander Penn Wooldridge was a real giant of the 19th century. He had a, a vision of Austin as a great town, as a great city, and one of the key components of that was having a great uh, public school system. A prominent local attorney, Wooldridge had come to Austin in 1872 and immediately became involved in civic matters. Uh, he's the guy, one of the guys who proposed that we build a dam to generate electric power. He also served on the committee that um, proposed Austin as the site for the State University. He was the Secretary of the Board of Regents for a while. 
AP Wooldridge had to fight all kinds of political battles to get public schools funded here in Austin, but uh, it has proved to be one of the most far-sighted uh, innovations, one of the most far-sighted gifts that AP Wooldridge uh, gave to the city of Austin. Due largely to Wooldridge's tenacity and persuasiveness, a special election on August 16, 1880 resulted in the city assuming control of public free schools within the Austin city limits and ultimately earning Wooldridge his reputation as the father of Austin public schools. Six trustees were elected to supervise the schools and at their first official meeting on November 9, 1880, Wooldridge was elected president. Professor John B. Wynn was named superintendent, necessary buildings and supplies were secured, and teachers were hired. City Public Schools opened under this new system September 12, 1881. Originally, the Austin Public School System had three departments. Primary, which consisted of first through fourth grades, grammar school, which was fifth through seventh grades, and a high school of juniors, intermediates, and seniors. All 10 grades were taught in one building on the present site of Pease Elementary School. The first Austin High School class had 16 boys and 31 girls in grades 8 through 10. So it was kind of a mixed ages and mixed grades. Boys and girls were, were segregated in the classes. It's interesting to note that men who wanted a good education really didn't patronize the Austin Public Schools through the turn of the century. It's going to be education substantially for women. Uh, there would be uh, English language, there would be A mathematics, it would go as high as trigonometry in those days. The best way to characterize it is that it's non-vocational, classical, uh, giving the, the kind of education, particularly to the young women, that they might have gotten if they attended one of those private academies. Immediately successful, the school system quickly assumed control of many of the smaller community-run schools around town. Enrollment doubled within the first year, and a new teacher started work every two weeks to accommodate the additional numbers. Twenty-six public schools were in session in Austin in 1882, and by 1890, total enrollment had increased to 2,710. Already, Austin's public schools were facing the challenges of relentless growth and creating additional classroom space for Austin's increasingly diverse students soon became a continuing struggle. The first ward school, which started as early as 1883, was the first public school to predominantly serve Austin's Mexican-American community. They had a habit of having at least a school in each ward of the city. The first ward was in the area that we now call Republic Plaza, and around that was a Mexican-American community here in Austin. The first ward school was a former warehouse, two rooms. The principal was also the custodian because she was able to uh, make extra money. And at the most, there were three teachers teaching anywhere from uh, 60 to 90 students. The school closed in 1901, and Austin's Mexican-American students were dispersed to other schools throughout the city. One of the first locations of a school for African-American children in East Austin was at San Marcos and 11th Streets and was known as the Robertson Hill School. Now, the Robertson Hill School uh, was the first place that had extensive classes beyond the eighth grade for African-American students, and that's the real true beginning of, of a, a strong, educational center for the east side. The school was established in 1884 and it continued in use until 1909. For its final 13 years, the Robertson Hill School was run by Principal L.C. Anderson. The son of a slave and a passionate supporter of the idea that the condition of African Americans could be improved through education, Anderson served as the first president of the group called the Colored Teachers State Association and he had been president of Prairie View A&M before coming to Austin and the Robertson Hill School in 1896. Even after the closing of the Robertson Hill School, Anderson continued to teach in Austin until his retirement in 1928, and his name and belief in education have continued to live on through the three high schools in Austin's history that have each carried his name. The Austin High School Department, which had begun with an enrollment of 66 students, quickly outgrew its original location. 
So by 1884, they moved to the Sunday school rooms of the First Baptist Church. By 1894, the high school was using all of those rooms and they looked around for a place to hold classes. The temporary Capitol building had been built at 11th in Congress after the old Capitol burned. They threw it up in two years and it was a piece of junk. They leased the second floor while private companies leased the first and third floor. The building burned down to the ground in uh, September uh, 1899. The kids didn't go to school at all for six weeks while they tried to figure out what to do. They found a dance hall slash opera house on West 6th Street. No one's left alive who went to school in the dance hall, but I bet they could tell stories about it now, how strange that had to be. The school district knew that the dance hall wasn't gonna work anymore, and they asked for a bond from the city to build a high school. They finally got the bond passed, and they built the building at 9th and Trinity Street for uh, $50,000. Austin High moved to the Old Red Building in 1900, where it would remain for a quarter century. In 1903, school officials selected A.N. McCallum to take the reins as the superintendent of Austin Schools, a decision that turned out to be a defining moment in Austin's education history. His leadership was crucial uh, through the formative years and particularly the development of the junior high school movement. He was very much in favor of not placing early adolescents in with the older adolescents, and that was part of the mystique of the junior high school movement. Upon arriving in Austin, McCallum immediately found the schools overcrowded and inadequately equipped. The public was generally indifferent, and many people were opposed to raising taxes further to maintain schools. Nevertheless, McCallum aggressively pursued a program of expansion without the benefit of extra funding. He worked tirelessly to implement new curriculum guidelines, adding classes in domestic arts, such as cooking and sewing. McCallum also endorsed statewide legislation that would provide uniform free textbooks and basic supplies to all children in the public schools. In 1906, McCallum oversaw the construction of the John B. Wynn School and Brackenridge and the Olive Street Schools for African-American children. He implemented Austin's first hot lunch program at Austin High School where all the meals were made and served by the girls in the school's cooking classes. And in 1908, Austin High School started its first night school so working adults could return to school and further their education. By 1910, enrollment had reached 4,822 and the teaching staff numbered 118. With the support of the city council, headed by now Mayor A.P. Woolridge, McCallum began to turn the tide of public support of schools by convincing voters to pass a major school bond allowing for the construction of Baker and Fulmore schools and the addition of a manual training wing to the high school. Another bond issue was passed in 1915, resulting in the construction of John T. Allen Junior High. But in 1916, Austin school enrollment jumped by 800 students with the passing of the compulsory school law, which required all children between 8 and 14 to attend school. McAllen realized that even more funding was needed, so he turned to an old friend and a strong supporter of public education, Austin millionaire A.J. Zilker. One of the more direct things that Zilker did to benefit the city and Austin schools was uh, to donate a great deal of public land either directly to the school systems or for the benefit of the school systems through the city. He gave Barton Springs to the schools and said, now sell this to the city and make them pay you $150,000. For those days, $150,000 was the annual budget of the school. So for him to engineer a sale of Barton Springs from the school district to the city is gonna provide a whole lot of additional money that would be used to begin building new schools. The United States entered World War I in April 1917 and Austin sent its share of young men to fight in the conflict. For the next year and a half, the war remained a prominent part of daily life in Austin and the schools were no exception. When Wilson called for a declaration of war in April 1917. The boys voted to form a cadet training corps 
And uh, there were so many of the kids that joined, there were four companies in a cadet battalion. And there's probably 240 to 280 kids in a dramatic 1918 photograph. It was a very patriotic war. Austin High students in particular faced the devastating toll of the war as many of their friends and former classmates were killed in action. Altogether, 22 Austin High alumni died in World War I, and in their memory, students purchased the Memorial Stone, which was placed at the Old Red Campus in 1920. And in the program of the 1920 dedication of the Memorial Stone, they speak of it as a symbol of peace and their grief for those who were lost in the war. So the Memorial Stone is not a tribute to war. We try to tell folks at the school that it actually hopes for peace while paying tribute to those who fell. Between 1900 and 1930, 10% of Mexico's population emigrated to the United States due to the unrest caused by the Mexican Revolution and the need for unskilled laborers to satisfy America's rapidly developing economy. The massive wave of immigration and the compulsory school laws dramatic expansion of enrollment combined to create an environment in which many Mexican-American students were essentially segregated. Faced with the dilemma of having to educate all Mexican-American children, many of whom could not speak English, the school system decided to separate English speakers from non-English speakers. There was a protest initially, primarily from the new immigrant population. Their feeling was that if that was going to be an issue, the language, that the students would better be served in their own neighborhood schools. Perhaps they could have separate classes within those schools to meet those students' needs. Nonetheless, parents were assured their children would return to neighborhood schools as soon as they could understand English. And despite protests from Austin's Mexican-American community, the West Avenue School was open, and many Mexican-American children from throughout the city were transferred to the school. Another concern of the parents was that the children would have to ride the streetcars, some as much as two miles away, and have to make two changes. But AISD felt that the need to have these children speak English would be better served than the difficulties of getting to the school. Following the Mexican-American community's protests, enrollment at the West Avenue School dropped from 105 to only 40 students, with many students being withdrawn to attend private or denominational schools. Despite the setback, the school district soon opened a school for younger Mexican-American students, the East Avenue School, which was later replaced by the Comal School. By the 1920s, the city of Austin was booming. The city boasted 35,000 residents and would add nearly 20,000 more before the decade was out. Students in Austin schools were being offered new classes in business and secretarial training and could choose between academic degrees for those students who intended to further their education in college or commercial degrees for students who wished to begin their careers right out of high school. Austin schools were feeling the effects of the growing population and by 1925, the old red building of Austin High School was facing a crisis of overcrowding. And when it opened, it was called the finest high school in the South, but it finally reached capacity. There just wasn't room to build anything else. And the local landowners didn't want to sell downtown property to expand the school into another block. With Old Red bursting at the seams and little possibility of expanding the school to create additional classroom space, McCallum and the school board took the unusual step of finding their solution just a few blocks away at the John Allen Junior High School located at 12th and Rio Grande. During Thanksgiving 1925, the decision was made that the schools would trade campuses and the kids who'd been in the middle school or junior high school were to go to the uh, old red campus. And the high school kids packed up their books and they went to school at 12th and Rio Grande. The 12th and Rio Grande location offered more room for additional expansions over the years, allowing Austin High's new home to remain in use for half a century, growing in student population throughout those years. Old Red, Allen Junior High's new campus, 
would remain in service until being destroyed in a spectacular fire in 1956. There's a picture that shows the light in the sky and folks in Buda knew something terrible was happening in Austin. They could look 30 miles north at the, at this, uh, at the northern horizon. It must have been a spectacular fire. By 1927, there were 20 Austin schools, each with its own library, lunchroom, and auditorium. There were five free kindergartens with a total enrollment of 220, the first having opened at Palm School in 1917, and PTA groups have been organized at each school. With the crash of the stock market in 1929, America's economy was under shambles. School budgets were cut nationwide. Many thousands of teaching jobs were lost, and most instructors who remained saw their salaries slashed. In many parts of the country, the public school system seemed in danger of complete collapse. Fortunately, Austin did not suffer as badly as many areas. We were a little bit insulated from the terrible effects of the Great Depression uh, because the University of Texas was here. And the University of Texas was subsidized by a huge oil find that was uh, discovered in about 1923. Austinites also had a knack for getting public funds and uh, they acquired a lot of funding from the Public Works Administration uh, to do an awful lot of uh, work around town. In many ways, the 1930s were actually very successful years for Austin Public Schools. A.J. Zilker left Zilker Park to the city, providing another $200,000 for home economics and manual training programs. By the end of the decade, a combination of bond issues and federal funding made well over $1 million available for school buildings and grounds, by far the largest amount that had ever been available to Austin schools. In 1933, the school district joined with the University of Texas to build a junior high school at 19th and Red River Streets. The new school would help alleviate crowded conditions at Austin schools while also providing university students with access to observe and practice teach. There would be greater access for their student teachers because the facility was right there. Student teaching is the last thing that a kid does when they get a teaching degree but the lab school would provide them the opportunity to observe and participate before that. You had many teachers who had PhDs, and we shared our work, and I taught special education. I would go down, and I'd say, now, I don't think anyone's ever done this before, but I'd like to do that, and he said, is it in the best interest of kids? Yeah, do it. Two years later, Zavala, Becker, and Rosewood schools were built, and other buildings were renovated. At the close of the 1930s, high schools had moved from 11-year to 12-year programs, and enrollment had increased to more than 15,000 students with a teaching staff of 479. With the opening of Zavala School, the segregation of Mexican-American students extended beyond primary education. More than 350 students were transferred from Bickler, Comal, Palm, and Met schools, despite the wishes of many parents that their children have the opportunity to learn and associate with children at their neighborhood schools. Americanization was the big term that they were using at the time, that they felt these children were coming from a principally rural area where agriculture uh, was practiced and they needed to be civilized as to Americanization. Educators at both Zavala and West Avenue schools attempted to fully Americanize Mexican-American students by methods that included banning the use of Spanish on the playground or in the classroom. With the closing of the Kamal School in 1936 and the West Avenue School in 1945, Zavala became the only remaining school in Austin designated specifically for Mexican-American children. In the spring of 1942, A.N. McCallum's failing health forced him into retirement. In his 39 years of service as superintendent, McCallum had seen Austin grow from a small rural community into a large metropolitan area. His leadership was crucial uh, through the formative years. And if anybody should be remembered by this school district as the architect of modern education in Austin, it's gonna be A.N. McCallum. 
Due to his incredible influence, Austin developed one of the elite public school systems in the state. His dedication to making sure all students received the best possible education distinguished him as one of Austin's most important and visionary leaders. He was mourned throughout the city when he died in 1943. In the 1940s, Austin schools responded in patriotic fashion to the various challenges brought on by World War II. During the Second World War, Austin was affected pretty much as, as other cities around the country. Uh, people had to cut back on what they consumed. Uh, they could only use gasoline, you know, using ration coupons. The same with some staples like sugar. There were drives to do things like collect tin foil and collect other items uh, for the war effort. The school board authorized full participation in the national defense effort. New classes reflected the war mentality with students studying subjects such as aircraft sheet metal work, motor repair, and blueprint reading. The entire manual training wing of Austin High School was placed at the disposal of the War Department. Immediately following the war, in 1946, a huge bond issue made possible the construction of seven new buildings, additions to 10 others, renovations of 13 buildings, and the building of two athletic fields. World War II also saw changes in the school district's policies toward Austin's Spanish-speaking community. In the early 1940s, classes on Latin American history were added to those concentrating on United States history, and courses in conversational Spanish were introduced in the 7th, 8th, and 9th grades. The practice of maintaining separate schools for Mexican Americans ended gradually, and Mexican American students began attending the schools nearest their homes. By the end of the decade, greater numbers of Mexican American students were attending Metz and Palm as well as Zavala schools, and the ethnic makeup of Austin's neighborhoods began changing dramatically. When Irby Carruth took over as school superintendent in 1950, he immediately faced a serious challenge due to the continuing expansion of the school district. The arrival of the first baby boomers and a building and maintenance deficit from the Depression and war years also took a considerable toll on Austin's schools and classroom shortages began to reach serious proportions. Austin High School's population had climbed to more than 3,000 students and the numbers were continuing to rise in elementary and junior high schools across the city. With a classroom crisis looming, the school district made the momentous decision to build three new high schools, including a new campus for the students of Anderson High School. First new school was named for a hero of the Texas Revolution, William B. Travis. And in a tribute to the guidance and leadership he had given Austin education for so many years, the second school was named for longtime superintendent A.N. McCallum. We're going to build a North High School and a South High School and a new African American school. And the unique thing about the African American school is that much of the design of Travis High School is used for the development of the Anderson campus because the Supreme Court had said in a number of decisions, facilities must be equal, but they can be separate. The September 1953 openings of Travis, McCallum, and Anderson High Schools marked a new era in Austin public education. Inevitably, the opening of additional high schools led to the development of unique identities for each, including new school songs, mascots, and colors. Heated rivalries naturally took shape thereafter. Probably the first rivalry that we had here in Austin between two ASD schools was the McCallum and the Travis rivalry. It became the Battle of the Bell. And there's still an old railroad bell with it's engraved, every score is engraved on that. And uh, Victor gets to ring the bell at the end of the deal. And tradition has it after midnight, it's bad luck to ring it anymore. So it sits in the, the library of the school who won it last. Like the Battle of the Bell, many rivalries in Austin revolved around athletics, which flourished around Austin schools. The major uh, competition or the rivalry was between Reagan and uh, and LBJ. That was always our biggest football game of the year, and those were the two most successful football programs at that time. Over the years, AISD students have participated in everything from football to lacrosse, 
and Austin schools have brought home innumerable trophies for their athletic achievements. Anyone that's affiliated with this particular high school, they want their sports teams to do well. And right behind that, if not in front of that, they want to have a big, wonderful band. Loud and spirited bands became a mainstay of football games as the school's music programs reflected what would soon become Austin's growing status as the live music capital of the world. We were uh, awakened every morning by the sound of the Anderson High School band out on the football field practicing. Uh, it seemed like we could hear the band all over East Austin. The group experience in the teamwork where you have a 120 piece band 80-piece orchestra, and in order to be good, you have to really want to be, and that takes a lot of work. A good music education program sets up many, many places for students to develop a sense of self-worth. I felt that my role was to musically educate the students as well as their parents, as well as the community. So they were exposed to a variety of music. By January 1954, Austin Public Schools had grown into one of the city's largest enterprises with property valued at $20 million, an enrollment of 23,000 students, and a professional staff of more than 1,000 in 45 schools. Coping with growth was a known and predictable difficulty, but an even greater conflict would soon arise in Austin and throughout the nation. After the Second World War and into the 1950s, Austin was pretty much a southern city in that the city was fairly well segregated into three ethnic communities, basically. Whites tended to live on the west side of town, um, the Mexican-American community had moved to the east side of town, and it was south of the black community, which was also on the east side of town. There was segregation of eating establishments um, going into the 1950s. There was segregation of, of park facilities, and uh, the schools were segregated as well. But around the country, a rising movement sought to end the segregation that had existed for so long. I attended Anderson from 1954 to 1956. When I was attending there, uh, the um, movement for desegregation and integration was just getting off the ground. The Supreme Court's 1954 ruling in Brown versus the Board of Education forced AISD to begin dealing with the issue of segregation in its schools. Austin reacted to the trademark decision of Brown v. the Board of Education in 1954 with, I'd say, the same kind of reaction as most cities in Texas and the South, a kind of reluctant acceptance. While leaders in the African-American community and students at Anderson High School praised the court's ruling, Governor Alan Shivers and State Education Commissioner J.W. Edgar predicted that complying with the order would be a lengthy process. There was a consciousness uh, be, and it, it was buoyed, shall I say, about what we were beginning to see more and more in the news. I think people in all three communities felt very uncomfortable uh, with this Brown v. the Board of Education legislation that basically said, well, your kids may have to move to a different high school. The subject of integration first appeared on the school board agenda in 1955. The trustees at that time decided they wanted to do something orderly, something that didn't scare a lot of people, and they decided they would start implementing a grade at a time beginning in high school and start sending kids uh, to their neighborhood school regardless of race. While the McCallum and Travis districts remain unchanged, the Austin High District was divided between Austin High and Anderson. This plan meant that Central Austin now had two high school districts, one of which was predominantly white and the other predominantly African-American. In 1956, 13 African-American students led the integration process at Austin's high schools. So they look forward in a lot of cases to what desegregation could mean in terms of quality of education and improvement in quality of education. But they found invisible lines in the school, which is a polite way to speak about people looked right through them. 
Despite the struggles of some students who took those historic first steps into what had been an all-white high school, the door was open for students like Joe Reed to be able to pursue their educational goals. When I went to Austin High, it was part out of curiosity, part out of uh, wanting to get the experience uh, of being in an integrated environment. I was uh, intending to attend the University of Texas. The University of Texas itself was undergoing the same integration growing pain, so to speak, as the senior high schools in Austin. And uh, I wanted that preparation. While still a difficult process, the new students at Austin High never had to face any of the violent clashes that plagued integration efforts in other parts of the South. We kind of had an inkling. We were prepared a little bit. And you walking in the door there and you didn't see any black students. You saw no one you knew. Here it was and you didn't know if there was going to be an incident. You didn't know if you were going to get stares, you know, were the students going to be staring at you or jeering at you or uh, you didn't know about anything about your acceptance. Some of the students, some of them warmed right up to you. Others were more standoffish. To some, I think we were a curiosity. To others, I think we were simply tolerated, you know, um, whatever feelings they may have had, you know, they kept it to themselves. The desegregation effort gradually spread through all of Austin's public schools with seventh grade being integrated in 1960 and the remaining grades following by 1963. But the resulting distribution of students revealed that only 10% of Austin's African-American scholars were now attending classes with white students. To some degree, even though the dual school system had been dismantled, you still had high concentrations of uh, African-American students in schools where they were virtually the whole population. In 1964, the school district tried another tactic for continuing the integration process. All of us needed to change our way of thinking about race. And, uh, and as a part of that, the school district said, let's try this. Let's get the best teachers from Anderson and integrate the faculties. Let's find white teachers who will integrate the Anderson faculty and the Keeling faculty. Charles Aikens, Booker T. Snell, and Bernice Smith were among the first African Americans to move to predominantly white schools as part of an effort to integrate the faculty. There might have been attitudes, but I, I lived above that because I just went on the level that people were people. It was easy for me because it's what I wanted to do and what I liked. And I think the true heroes of the integration movement in this town is those African-American teachers who crossed over and taught at O'Henry and Austin High. Three years later, Austin's integration movement found a new voice when Wilhelmina Delco became the first African-American elected to the AISD Board of Trustees. That same year, students living in the Anderson High School area were given the opportunity to enroll at the local high school of their choice. They had just voluntarily put in something called the Majority to Minority Transfer Rule. And this applied to African Americans only. If you were in any school, particularly high school, in which you were a majority, you could ask for a transfer to a school in which you were not a majority. And it was particularly difficult because they did not provide any um, transportation. It was very selective in terms of people who could afford to travel to the school there and afford to come back and afford any transportation that was necessary to enable them to participate in extracurricular activities. A 1968 investigation by the Department of Health, Education and Welfare concluded that Austin's public schools remained a dual system and as a result, the school board was ordered to scrap its freedom of choice plan and create a new plan by the beginning of 1969. There was an attempt to uh, rezone students from the Maplewood attendance area over into the formerly all-black Anderson High School that the federal judge uh, Jack Roberts, the local district judge, ordered in 1970. Over that weekend, I will never forget it, the students at Anderson came back and they cleaned up in the school district as if in recognition that this was different painted the whole school, they were hauling lab equipment in and all the kind of things that were not only appropriate but necessary. We had big welcome signs out in front of the building. And a kind of tragic thing occurred because the Anderson students really prepared for it and then 
uh, the white students who were scheduled to go didn't go. And that's when we had the white flight situation. There had been some movement out and of course some protestation on the part of some of the whites who lived in that Maplewood area, but they expressed their intent to leave and so Judge Roberts ruled that Thursday that this was not going to work. And since in his opinion it was not going to work, he ordered Anderson closed as a high school. Although the move to close Anderson was made with the intention of forcing integration, the majority of students and parents, as well as the school's alumni, were dissatisfied and felt the closure was handled hastily and without proper consideration of the school's unique history and traditions. Even today, the people of Austin that pass through the halls of Old Anderson look back at their alma mater with a pride and a passion that few other schools can claim. Anderson High really was one of the better African-American schools in the country and had, had a national reputation. That was the one thing in the community that we all had in common as we all went to Anderson High School. We were always taught that we were as good as anybody else. Our teachers you know, always reminded us that because uh, they knew that we would go on and into life and uh, they tried not to let us feel inferior and we took that with us as we left Anderson and it became a very valuable part of our Anderson experience. The closing of Anderson created numerous dilemmas for the school district and new superintendent Jack Davidson. Former Anderson students were forced to bus to schools across the city and the board was also left with the uncertainty of what to do with Austin's lone remaining central high school. Uh, by 1970, it was obvious that the old Rio Grande campus had seen its best days. The real estate around the campus was just so high priced. New school construction was following the suburban expansion of the city. Johnston High School had opened in 1960, followed by Lanier, Reagan, Crockett, and LBJ High Schools during the 1960s and early 70s. Bond elections were held every five years during this period, resulting in the building of more than 30 new schools and a great relief to students across the city, air conditioning for all the schools. With much of Austin's population moving to the suburbs, school officials debated the necessity of maintaining a high school in central Austin. Most cities have lost the old central high school. Dallas High is gone, San Antonio, Maine is gone, Houston, Sam Houston's gone. It could have been very easy to just say, let's just make it a donut, and everybody goes to a suburban school. As the tension around integration continued, school officials, led by school board president Will Davis, realized that a new Central High School would not only continue a long and proud tradition, but would also be key to the question of integrating schools in Austin. And Davis constantly said, we have to have a Central City High School where all the folks can come together because if we blow up the Central City High School, we are increasing the isolation built by housing patterns. So it was Davis and the board who insisted that they find a Central City location for the school. And we've coined the phrase, it was the belt buckle of the city's integration efforts. In the end, the school board chose a site very close to the park that A.J. Zilker had donated for the benefit of the school system more than 50 years earlier. The location of the new campus pulled students from all over Central West and East Austin and created a balanced racial mix that would set the standard for Austin's integration plans. We we're about 50% Anglo and 30%, 35% uh, Hispanic and 15% Black for much of the time I was here. As part of its continuing efforts to desegregate the schools of Austin, the school district began busing thousands of students to schools across the city beginning in 1971. Busing continued in Austin for almost 20 years, during which time parents, educators, administrators, and school board members debated the pros and cons of the practice frequently and passionately. We as parents will not cooperate with any plan that causes dramatic losses in real estate values of our home. Do we want to provide equal educational opportunities to all children or equal children to all educational facilities? Black kids through the educational system are being allocated to low status roles. After busing was discontinued, 
deep divisions remained on its ultimate value and effectiveness. And when the topic arises today, it still elicits very strong opinions on all sides. Nonetheless, maintaining diversity in Austin schools has remained a top priority for every school administration since. Over the last few decades, Austin's population has exploded and the city has truly become a major metropolitan area. Sustained growth has forced Austin to address a litany of significant city planning issues, but has also resulted in major economic development. Now we have road systems, we have communities all over the area, we have entrepreneurs, we have a, a basis of money and expertise uh, and population to where we are a major city. Austin's public schools have also spent the last few decades coping with incredible growth, as well as embracing greater diversity among the student population and anticipating and responding to important educational trends. The addition of Bowie, Aikens, and a new Anderson High School brought the total number of comprehensive high schools in Austin to 11. The school district and the Board of Trustees even went beyond high school and helped create the Austin Community College system in the early 1970s. By the early 21st century, the population of Austin schools had reached a remarkable 82,000 students and a total staff of more than 11,000 teachers and faculty. Today, throughout the city, new schools and new teaching innovations allow all students the opportunity to develop their unique skills. For at-risk students, Garza Independence High School provides a wonderful opportunity to work toward graduation at the student's own pace with the further goal of transitioning to college or employment. But this is a school that is an academic school of choice and the original intent was to help the district reduce its dropout rate and to provide a viable option that didn't exist. It is one of the best schools in America for schools that take dropouts and get them to graduate. Recognized as a model school throughout the country, Garza provides a unique environment designed to remove the traditional barriers to succeeding in high school and utilizes a solution-focused approach to dropout prevention. But once you go to Garza, you get this, we call it a metanoia, a change of heart. The kids start owning their learning. Each kid has strengths, so it's our job to find out what that is, let them use those strengths to their advantage. So we want to learn from Garza, especially about the student engagement, not just in the classroom, but outside the classroom. Student engagement is at the forefront of many of AISD's initiatives, including the recent creation of the new tech school at Aikens High. Instead of a uh, teacher using a lecture style or PowerPoint presentation, students will be posed a problem that they have to solve. Projects or problems that they will be given are problems and projects that are relevant to their everyday life, things that they can relate to and have an interest in solving. But that's what we should be shooting for, for kids really engaging in the learning, researching themselves, getting excited about it. They will remember what they've learned forever. At the first academy of its kind in Texas, students engage in high-tech, project-based learning using computers every day for creating presentations, building websites, doing research, and communicating with others. Just being able to have a lot more, not necessarily freedom, but a lot more independence of that you're actually the one responsible for yourself. You have a motivation and you have a challenge behind you and they, they expect you to do and give your best when you do it. And it's just, it feels great to have teachers that you know, really care about you. We hope that through this program, they will discover what their true interest is. AISD is also offering a new school of choice specifically for young women. The Ann Richards School for Young Women Leaders is a college preparatory school of excellence for grades 6 through 12, educating young women for academic, civic, and career leadership. Ann Richards School is sort of a unique offering in the district in that 
it allows girls the opportunity to make choices about what kind of path they want to follow in the school system. The Ann Richards School is based on three areas that Ann Richards really was very interested in making sure girls uh, had advantages in leadership, going to college, and wellness. What I found most interesting about it was that it would give you know the girls of Austin a better opportunity to you know be mathematicians and scientists and you know things that guys are you know better at. The school is open to girls throughout Austin with priority given to applicants from economically disadvantaged families. For the next 50 years, if you're a fifth grade parent and you have a daughter, you can choose to go to a girl's school. You see, it gives you, the parent, a choice. It's a school uh, for girls who dream big. But creating new schools is only part of the plan for the future of Austin education. One of AISD's most innovative projects is the redesign of its 11 existing comprehensive high schools to better prepare students to succeed in college and future careers. Redesigning means uh, re-examining um, educational priorities in a comprehensive traditional high school. It isn't the teacher at the front and children taking notes. It's got to be the teacher getting students to think, conceptualize, problem solve, communicate, work in groups. Each high school will engage students by offering several choices of study related to broad ranges of college and career interests, such as science and technology or humanities and law. And that allowed us to create basically smaller learning communities and that translates into clustering kids into smaller groups and they share the same teachers. Really having some in-depth knowledge about the student's skill set, uh, about what they hope to accomplish, what they hope to study, what interests them, what, what motivates them. It takes learning to a, a totally different level. Partnering with the AISD on the redesign project are the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Both foundations believe that AISD can be a national model for future urban high schools. The Gates Foundation has been a wonderful partner with public schools across America. With stronger teacher-student relationships and more enthusiastic student involvement, the high school redesign program signify a revolution in Austin's public schools, a revolution that will create stronger students and, in turn, creative and productive members of society that will someday leave their own imprints on the city of Austin. It's about children doing better because they must get the good job. They're our future. From modest one-room schoolhouses to a wide-ranging network of more than 100 school campuses, the Austin Independent School District has worked to give the children of Austin an educational experience that will help them succeed in every facet of their adult life. They do the right thing and encourage everybody else to follow suit. So they're excellent role models for the rest of the community. I think it's the best district in the, in the state. You know, I just, I, I will always be proud to be associated with it. If you work hard and a teacher and a system supports you, we can do well. And we have a vision of excellence and equity for all children. The schools of Austin have brought innovations and creativity to the classroom that reflect the imagination of a city that continues to be a center of culture and education in Texas. And that mission will remain the same for the next 125 years. I went to Baker Elementary School, which was about four blocks from my home. And I didn't want to go to school. I went the first day and I said, uh, I got to go home. The teacher said, why? I said, because you're not my mama. <laughs> it didn't work. <laughs> Some of them didn't want to go to a certain math teacher because if you didn't get it, he had a little strap that he'd give you a couple of whacks. You know? I began teaching in Austin in 1939, having taught in Kerrville for two years. And I was really excited about coming to the big city. It was much smaller than it is now, but it was big to me. One that I remember in particular, his name was Guy Bazell. 
he was a young male teacher and he just returned from World War II. I, I remember him being a blushing when we studied the reproduction system in biology. My sixth grade art teacher, Mrs. Crawford. At the end of that year, there was a competition out at Laguna Gloria. She entered my works and I won. The two drawings that won, strangely enough, were both buildings. I can go back and I remember standing there all dressed up in my finest and getting my little ribbon and badge uh, from Laguna Gloria and my drawing behind and thinking, architecture, hmm, wonder what that's all about. I was coming down the steps, the boy stairwell one day, and at the bottom of the stairwell, I met Coach Pickwick. And he asked me, hey boy, you play football? I said, no sir, I don't play football. Well, you do now. That's all he said. The first job I was ever elected to was to be captain of the safety patrol at uh, Bracker Woods Elementary. Well, I know Miss Williams, I mean, and we still talk now. I, I must have worried her to death, you know, because I have a, a, I'm really anxious about a lot of things. So when I was preparing to go to college, I know I must have been at her doorstep every day, you know, is this application the right? I need to take more classes. I don't have the right GPA. Am I going to miss the SAT? Blah, blah, blah. And she was very patient. We were a family of words, and so I was always into something, writing the school song at Wilded School, which my mother had me do while I had scarlet fever to keep me in bed. And they sang it for a while. And we didn't have caps and gowns. I had, my mother had to have somebody make me a dress, cost her $13 to have that dress made. <laughs> to use in the graduation. I did not like PE at all. I just thought it was a waste of my time because <laughs> I was uh, interested in math and science and to me PE was just plain waste of my time. Nobody, and I was so young and there were no counselors, nobody told me that was dumb. <laughs> you know, I didn't know. <laughs> what did I know? 